Hey everyone, Gil Gross here, and it is time for another mailbag where I answer your hot takes, your observations, your questions, and ultimately your comments about tennis or anything else. Over 24 hours ago, I posted on the YouTube community tab lots of thought provoking, deep philosophical questions this week. That's what uh, stood out to me. And it is, of course, the, the year end mailbag. Now, I will be honest, there is nothing particularly different or special about this mailbag. It just happens to be the final mailbag of the season. Uh, but as we do head into the offseason, I'm uh, I'm likely to do uh, some mailbags with some themes. I know that I'm going to do a mailbag where I won't allow you guys to ask any questions about professional tennis. So... We have that to look forward to. This is the last regular mailbag of the 2023 season. And with that, let's get into it. I'll go about an hour. I pulled 22 questions. I will try to get to as many as possible. The first one comes from Sharon. It is about Mr. Andre Rublev. Rublev mentioned in an interview after Turin that one factor making it difficult to improve his second serve is his racket weight slash string tension. Do players' racket specs often influence the way they work on various shots, or is it the other way around? Here's what Rublev said, Google translated from Russian. Interviewer, what are the problems with your second serve? Andre, the rackets I play with do not impart speed to the ball on their own. I need to invest myself. Therefore, the faster I want to speed up the ball, the more I need to invest, and this means risk and mistakes. Knowing all of this, when the score is tied on the second serve, I get pinched. The movement turns out to be crumpled and uncertain. Even when the score is comfortable and I can afford to serve the second serve harder, I still need to put more effort than many other top players because they have different tension and the balance is more in the head of the racket. This is fascinating. Uh, you know, a couple of years ago, I would have told you that Andre Rublev's second serve is the worst weakness in all of the top 10, up there with Tsitsipas' backhand return. It was a real liability that was going to prevent Rublev from really accomplishing what he wants to accomplish. Now, he's improved it a lot, but if I were to put a number on it, I'd say Rublev's second serve went from maybe like 20th percentile Let's say you take the top 100. I think it was like a 20th percentile second serve. Very, very poor. Uh, now I'd say it's around 50th percentile, which is pretty average. But when you're a top 10 player and you're expected to compete with the very best in the world, anything that's average is, is going to be seen as an area that's holding you back. And in the case of Rublev, despite the improvements on his second serve that are really, really clear, especially in the speed department, it's still something that holds him back when he goes up against the very best. Um, so I guess that your first question is kind of like, does racket technology uh, influence the way players work on, on various shots? I mean, just like with technique... Just like with tactics, racket technology, which is, by the way, not an area of expertise personally, uh, if there's anything that comes up in, in a big way in this category, I will have uh, Jonas from Tennis Nerd on the show to talk about it because it's not really where I, I excel from a knowledge standpoint. But just like uh, technique and tactics have trade-offs, like racket technology has trade-offs. So... For Rublev, you know, who who uses a more underpowered setup, probably a higher tension. Uh, from the sound of it, he has a um, hit the balance of the weight is more uh, towards the handle um, of the racket versus the head of the racket. If I'm reading his statement correctly, it, it, what it sounds like is he has a, a control oriented setup and. The reason why maybe a control-oriented setup might help him on the forehand in particular and maybe even the backhand is because Rublev swings incredibly fast. His racket speed is spectacular. And if you have a, a technology, basically you can afford to have control-oriented, low-powered uh, racket technology if you swing that fast and you're going to get the benefit of of power just based on how quickly you're able to get your racket head through space, you're going to get the control 
uh, from your racket technology. And that's why, you know, Rublev is not a high risk player. Uh, he can achieve these really, really high ground stroke speeds over and over and over again, sustaining aggression without being erratic. That's the key to his game. So perhaps his racket um, it is set up to help him in that way. But what he's saying here, um, I, I don't know that he's using his racket as an excuse for the issues he has on his second serve. What he's basically saying is he decelerates in big moments because he, he said, quote, you know, when the score is tight, um, let's see, the translation says when the score is tied, but I'm assuming it's just a rough translation. And it means when the score is tight on my second serve, I get pinched. I get nervous. And he says, you know, the movement turns out to be crumpled and uncertain. What I think he's really saying is he decelerates on the second serve and he just doesn't get enough weight or speed on his kick serve on the second delivery. Um, that is not his racket's fault. That's yeah, maybe the racket doesn't make up for his deceleration like a more, you know, high power setup would, and he's not able to get that easy power even if he decelerates. But I don't know. I mean, any player who swings, who kind of slows down their racket in a tight spot on their second serve is going to suffer negative consequences for doing so. So I don't know. It, it's an it, it's interesting. It's a very interesting comment from Rublev. Maybe he does need to, like just develop his cojones on the second serve in that case and just figure out a way psychologically to get over that hump and and try to go for more on the second serve. His double fault rates are extremely low, uh, 2.4% um, on the year. I mean, let me, let's me let see how that stacks up. If I And I know we're going super deep on this. This is really a, a deep dive for this first mailbag question to start us off. Uh, yeah. Okay. So the stats confirm 2.4% double fault rate. Extraordinarily low. He is one, two, three, four, five, six, seventh lowest in the top 50 in double fault rate. So that tells me he can afford to probably take a little extra risk in big spots on his second serve, not be so fearful of the double fault. Because if he double faults, um, you know, that's, uh, again, we, we talk about the psychological fear of double faulting, getting in the way sometimes of doing what you actually should do on the second serve. When you're facing Yannick Sinner or Novak Djokovic and you're hitting a weak, attackable second serve, uh, you're putting yourself in a terrible position to win the point anyway. So uh, why is it better to lose the point that way than lose the point on a double fault? In both cases, you've lost the point. I understand that psychologically it feels worse to double fault, but uh, I, I think if you're able to kind of get over that mental barrier and understand, in order to give myself a chance to win, I have to reach a certain, uh, I have to reach a certain level on my second serve. I need to hit, let's say, 95 miles per hour as a benchmark. Then then, you know, do it, go for it because the double faults are not a problem here. So I don't know, you know, I, I always thought with Rublev, maybe uh, it could be physical strength, like strength in the legs, uh, maybe could improve his, his second serve a little bit. Maybe he can try to incorporate uh, a slice second serve. If that's more comfortable for him, that's going to hurt him on the clay, but it might help him indoors on hard courts. It's going to be interesting to follow. He understands it's a weakness. He knows, and he said recently, that the two things that hold him back more than anything are the psychology and his second serve. All right. I'm not going to be able to go as in-depth on these other comments, but um, I thought that was really interesting. So thank you for that, Sharon. Uh, next question is from Icardis. In my opinion, one of the most underrated stories this year was Shea Suwe's comeback. She took a break at the end of 2021, then came back in April 2023. At age 37 to the women's doubles tour, she won Roland Garros with Wang Xinyu and Wimbledon with Barbara uh, Strakova, her sixth Grand Slam doubles title. And she reached the U.S. Open doubles semifinal. What do you make of her comeback? Besides her technical skills, do you see some strategic differences that might explain her success? 
Well, I mean, I can't break down the strategic differences. And if I'm being honest, I would have loved to watch more of these matches, but uh, I don't watch a lot of doubles. So I'm not going to lie to you guys and say that I do watch a lot of doubles. Uh, what I will say in general with Shea Su Wei, everybody should study her. Everybody should study Shea Su Wei carefully and uh, as closely as possible because she is literally the best example there is about how to be disruptive using uh, ball placement and how to be disruptive without the use of pace. Because she doesn't have pace. All she has really going for her is an ability to put the ball wherever she wants. Extreme control. And she's able to, again, disrupt and create damage by putting the ball in difficult locations, taking away depth, adding depth, using the width of the court, uh, using uh, um, mixing up her heights. There is nobody better at that than Shea Su Wei. She's an absolute magician when it comes to using variety to her advantage. And, you know, it's unconventional, right? Obviously, like, she doesn't really take full swings at the ball, full cuts at the ball all the time. Um, she's kind of bunting the ball around the court. But everybody should kind of be able to watch what she does and be like, okay, th these are kinds of things you can do with pace out of the picture to still be effective. All right. Next one is from member Jacob. Would love to know your thoughts on what John Wertheim tweeted earlier this week. Quote, hearing more chatter about the slams joining to acquire 10 biggest events, forming a super tour with Saudi Arabia getting a 10th event, leaving the ATP and the WTA to run 500s and year-end finals. How likely do you think this goes through? What are the revenue sharing differences between the ATP and slams? Thanks. Well, um, this is this was wild to see. This was wild to read when I was scrolling across my Twitter feed. Um, at, certainly, most certainly, if this story develops, I'm going to be able to cover it in more depth. But for now, here is what I'll say. Just the fact that this is being discussed, you have to think, okay, why? The fact that this is even being entertained means something. Because for a super tour to be created, for all of the slams and the 1000s to come together, right? The strongest products in tennis to come together and create one. All of the governing bodies, right? The people who run the US Open at the USTA, the people who run Wimbledon at the LTA, the people who run Roland Garros at the FFT, Tennis Australia and the Australian Open, and the ATP and the WTA, right? All of these people would lose agency and power. Because right now, the main advantage and perk that they have is they get their own say, right? They get to govern their events on their own. And they are now looking at each other, all of each other, and thinking there might be a better way to do this. Um, which means, which means there are some very compelling arguments that because the the governmental or yeah the the structure of tennis is so fractured and segmented they are leaving tons and tons and tons of money on the table because this is the reality right nobody wants to give up power and agency nobody wants to just give that up for fun you give that up only if you know that you would get paid very very handsomely in return for giving that up so, like I know, you know, The Athletic and, and Matthew Futterman also reported on this. The thought is that if uh, media and sponsorship rights could be bundled all into one, and now you are coming at, uh, now you're coming at, you know, media distribution channels and sponsors, and you have a package deal, and it's, yeah, like, we are tennis. We are, this is... This is a massive, massively valuable property now if we're all combining each other. Uh, basically, the thought is that they can all make more money collectively by combining the media rights and the sponsorship rights instead of selling it individually 
and therefore they're competing against one another and potentially driving down the values of each other's properties. So I'm going to leave it at that. Um, I guess you did ask me, how likely do you think this goes through? I mean, at face value, not very likely. This would be a, a huge undertaking. I, I think it's more likely that the ATP and the WTA merge operations. I think that's a little bit more likely than all of the biggest powers in tennis coming together and creating a super tour of like 11 events. All right, next one is from Caleb Wong. Should tennis advertise the gladiator aspect more? Growing up, I thought tennis was too dainty and not a sport at all, but I came across it and loved the one-on-one -on -one gladiatorial aspect where it's a physical battle in front of a hyped up crowd like AO 2012. This piqued my interest and I eventually found out tennis is the best sport. Would doing this increase the popularity of tennis overall, attracting more of the athletes growing up? Well, yes. I mean, I don't even know how much to add to this other than totally, yes, 100%. What these guys put their bodies through is intense. What they are putting their mind through is really, really intense. It's badass. They are superhumans. And the more the sport and, you know, folks in charge of promoting the sport can try to get that across the better. I do think it's hard. Like it's not just you snap your fingers and you make it really easy to see just how freaking difficult and um, insane this game is, right? It, it's not easy, but uh, yeah, anything, anything that can take away the kind of country club reputation of tennis, in my opinion, makes it appeal to a broader audience. And is also more true, I think is more true to the sport, right? Like, I'm not saying that we need to get rid of any notion of uh, tennis being a, uh, I don't know, a, a gentleman sport, a, a sport that has a kind of a, a hinge or a twinge of, of class or a sport that people like to play at, at rich private clubs. Like, that's all fine and well, but... I'll tell you what, like when you go to these academies with these top players, the guys who are really going to make it and play high level college tennis and play high level tennis in the pros, it doesn't look like a country club, man. It, it does not look like a country club. It looks like a boot camp. The fitness is tough. The training is tough. The feet are ugly. The blisters, the sweat, it's it's not it's not a uh it's not a nice picture. It doesn't feel good either when you're training at the at the the level that that is required. Now, um as a recreational activity, if that's not how you interact with tennis, if you like it because of the social aspect, if you like to play doubles, if you like it as, you know, just regular exercise, that's all fine again. But tennis at the pro level, yeah, it is very very gladiatorial. And uh I do think a lot of casual sports fans who have not taken the time to understand the game they don't know that. They don't feel that way about tennis from afar. Next one from Ron Robbie. Hi, Gil. Congrats on another successful year. Thank you. I've asked you about Tsitsipas and Zverev in the first MMA of the 2023 season, so only fitting to ask about them at the very last one as well. On a scale of 1 to 10, how would you rank their seasons? They had opposite trajectories all through the year, with Zverev struggling early on and finishing strong, and Tsitsipas the exact opposite. Has Zverev reached his optimal pre-injury level? What are your expectations of him for 2024? For Tsitsipas, uh, is he on his way out of the top 10? He seemed like an afterthought for pretty much every big tournament after Roland Garros and delivering accordingly. Do you see him becoming a contender again for big titles? Cheers. All right, let's start with Zverev. Look, coming into the year, I thought it was going to be a struggle early on. It was. 
but the way he rebounded, uh, the way he recovered his ranking, and the level that he ultimately reached by the end of the year, I would say yes, pre-injury level. Uh, there are great things about that. There are times you see him, you think, okay, this is this is a top, this is a, an elite player. This is a player that can win anything, any match against anybody. And then there are times where you say, oh, okay, well, that's those are the things that hurt him throughout his career. Uh, so to me, just watching Zverev in the second half, yeah, it's just the same old Alexander Zverev. All the good parts about him, all the bad parts about him, they were all there. The fact that he made that that full recovery from his injury makes this season uh, a complete success because it's not a given that that's gonna gonna happen so quickly, so smoothly, so easily. On court, I, I would say Zverev would get an eight for his 2023 season. I would give him a really high score. I, I don't think you can talk about them without mentioning though that there was another big blow off the court, a big blow. In, in a lot of different ways to to his brand, to his reputation, uh, which is the penalty order that the German court uh, levied against him that, yes, Zverev will have a chance to appeal. But I think, you know, given the fact that... Given the fact that that is a, a court, uh, that is a legal system that has literally imposed a penalty against Alexander Zverev... Uh, I think in a lot of other sports leagues, he would have taken a suspension for that. And I think the ATP's approach is going to be, okay, let him appeal and see what happens after that. But if you're going to ask me about Zverev heading into next year, that has to be a part of the conversation. Like there is a, there is a decent chance that Zverev faces a suspension from the tour next year if, uh, if this goes the wrong way for him or if this goes against him uh, legally. So the on-court, really good for Zverev. The fact that another one of these came up, yeah, I mean, that that is extremely disappointing. We'll see what happens, though, as we get more information about this case, as the appeal plays out. Uh, maybe Zverev can redeem himself or exonerate himself, both legally and in the court of public opinion. He's going to have uh, you know, the chance to do that, the chance to say uh, what, whatever he wants, as he did the first time around. And uh, we'll have to just track that. But it, it does need to be attached to, I think, the Zverev 2023 story. As for Tsitsipas. Yeah, I mean, frustrating season, right? Uh, great in January, great in Australia. From there, what were the highlights? Winning the title in Los Cabos. Uh, the clay court season was consistent. Uh, at, at the very least, he did make a couple of runs, but it was also his worst clay court season in two or three years, easily. No improvement on the grass. Wimbledon could have been worse than it was. I mean, I'll say that the, the Murray performance at Wimbledon was good. He gets through the, the first round against team in a fifth set tiebreak. I mean, you know, it's not the most impressive thing that he was able to win that first round match against the Dominic team who wasn't doing all that much in the in that part of the year whatsoever. Um, but at least he won it. He made the round of 16. On paper, he did take an upset defeat to Christopher Eubanks there. We know that the North American hard courts were, were really tough on him um, from Canada to Cincinnati to the U.S. Open. He, he started to right the ship a little bit on the indoor hard courts at the end of the year. You know, good in... Um, in Vienna, I believe, a pretty good in Paris, losing in a third set tiebreak to Dimitrov in the semifinal. And then he he has the injury at the tour finals. So it was a season without highlights for without a lot of highlights for Tsitsipas. But you know, he also finishes the year six in the world. In a year where there were a lot of injury issues. You know, there was shoulder stuff at Indian Wells, I think still affecting him at Monte Carlo. Uh, the back injury at the ATP Finals. A lot of instability in his camp. I really think this hurt him a ton, especially North American hardcourt season. I think this uh, this really hurt the way that he was competing and his mental focus on the court. The fact that he had trouble figuring out what the coaching setup was going to be. Was it his father? Was it Mark Philippoussis? I think the the 
both at once things started to grate on him, started to be a distraction for him, uh, too many cooks in the kitchen situation. And then he ended up going back and forth a couple of times. And, you know, when it was, uh, when it was Philippousis without his father, he just didn't feel like he had that presence in his box that was giving him, I guess, enough, you know, fire and energy to compete at his best. So that certainly didn't work. When it comes to next year, and by the way, I would give him maybe a five, a five for this season because I don't want to take away what he did in Australia. I do want to have some sympathy for the injuries that he suffered. Um, I do want to have some perspective about a season where he finished year-end number six, which is only two spots off of what he'd done the last two years prior. Uh, going into next year, I think a lot of things can normalize. I think he can, he can have a healthier year. I think he can have some stability in his coaching. Um, you know, maybe he gets kind of more used to his, his balance off the court. Um, like, I don't, I don't know how that situation will, will develop. And it's something that, again, I really shied away from talking about with, you know, getting into the relationship with Bedosa for a long, long time. Uh, but when he says that it has a huge effect on his outlook and his mentality on life, um, uh, when, when he says that, what am I going to do other than believe him, um, that, that it's the case. So I, I think 2024 is likely to be a lot of normalization for Titi Pass, a more consistent year with a lot more highlights than we saw this year. I think there's a lot of reason to believe that. Uh, we see it all the time. We saw it for Medvedev last year. Sometimes players have a year where everything seems to go wrong and the confidence goes the wrong way and the health and the off-court stuff, you know, a couple of things can happen. And as long as, you know, the body isn't breaking down permanently, usually you'll see, you'll see things start to correct themselves the next year. From MA, hi Gil, I think Djokovic will retire as a top five player. I feel that the moment he loses more than a few important matches, probably at majors, he will realize he can't improve anymore at this stage of his career and will simply call it quits. I don't see him playing if he starts losing in the first week of a Grand Slam for more than a year. Probably at least one or two more good years in front of him until that happens. Thoughts? All right, and then there's another question, which I'll get to in a moment. I don't know how much I can say about this. I just think I would caution against speculation in this respect because it's really hard to figure out how players are actually going to go about things in this respect. The general rule of thumb, I'm not talking about Novak right now. I'm just talking about most players. Most players play until one of two things happen. Either one, they can't qualify for for big tournaments anymore. And then it's, okay, I ain't here to play challengers. Uh, so that is, that is one way where players are kind of ushered into retirement. The other way, this perhaps even more common, is that the body makes it so miserable for them to be out on tour. They are no longer enjoying uh, the, the game like they once were. It is no longer fun for them to go out and train every day and to go out and play tournaments every week uh, because their body is making life hell. Most players don't stop just because they start to lose a few more matches. The question is obviously Novak, who who is in a very different position than most players, uh, will, will it be different for him? It, it could be. It also could not be. Uh, because it's it's obviously enjoyable for him to play. Yes, I I do think that there is a certain way about Novak where it probably wouldn't be a lot of fun for him if he's not winning the biggest tournaments. But I, I would have said the same thing about Andy Murray. I really would have. Yes, somebody who who didn't win nearly as many big titles as Djokovic was not you know, used to doing that to the extent that Novak has, but I'm just, just going to throw it out there. I, I wouldn't have thought that Andy would have had any interest in doing what he's been doing the last couple of years either, but, but he has had interest. It's really hard to tell with these kinds of things. Uh, second question here, would it be smart for Djokovic to skip Wimbledon slash grass and stay training on the clay between Roland Garros and Olympics? I know he won't do it considering Wimbledon is too important, but would it be smart to sacrifice just one Wimbledon for a much better chance at the Olympics? I, I would not really ever advise in preparation for a tournament to not play for 
a month or longer. I, I would, I just never really consider that advisable. So for Novak to skip the grass court season, he would be kind of self-imposing a pretty long layoff. And yes, Djokovic has had success after taking long breaks, most recently Paris Bercy, Masters 1000, that he was able to win on the heels of a long time away from the match court. But I, I just never think it's a, a smart thing to do. I think it's much better to continue to feel the nerves of match play, uh, continue to build the confidence of winning real matches, simulate the the physical grind that is winning tough physical matches. So for all of those reasons, I do not think it would be smart for Novak to do that. From the man, Craig O'Shaughnessy mentioned this week that he can tell Novak is nervous when he stops hitting inside out forehands. I noticed that Carlos was able to really make him feel uncomfortable by pinning him on his backhand side, both in Wimbledon and Cincinnati. Additionally, tense matchups such as Jera at the US Open also had aspects of this. What are your thoughts on this? I personally think that it's a glaring weakness for an otherwise thought of strength. Why do you think it's so hard for players to exploit this if it's a known issue? I love Craig. I would love to have a longer conversation about this with Craig, but I don't think no I, I think especially off clay, Novak oftentimes chooses not to hit inside out forehands. And I don't think it has anything to do with him being nervous. It's just about him trying to stay in position. Because I think usually he feels that if he stays in position and stays solid in that way and doesn't give his opponents an opening, he will be able to outlast them and pick them apart from there. Like it's never been a part of Novak's game. Like I am just going to desperately run around my backhand. I know desperately is maybe. Uh, a little bit of a exaggerated or dramatic word to use, but like the point is, he doesn't like to open himself up. He doesn't like to give his opponents opportunities offensively. He would much rather stay in position and be solid on the backhand. That's just part of his game. So I would uh, I would need some convincing to get behind the the claim here that Djokovic not running around his forehand is a sign that he is nervous, albeit um, particularly on the clay, that is an air, you know, I think in slower conditions, it, it becomes very necessary that Novak does hit more run around forehands because uh, otherwise he just can't be dangerous offensively. He can't apply enough pressure with his two-hander in heavy conditions. He needs the extra weight of shot that is the forehand in which case it becomes well worth it for Novak to run around the backhand and hit as many forehands as possible. But I think usually he does that on clay. Um, I wonder what match Craig was talking about. Um, I mean, you mentioned Wimbledon. You mentioned Cincinnati. Those are very, very quick conditions. Novak does not like to hit a lot of runaround forehands in conditions like that. And it's, it's worked out very, very well for him. Next one from SJ. Hi, Gil. I have a few questions for you. One, do you have a specific style of play you enjoy watching more than others? Um, hmm. Good question. Definitely changed for me. And I, I guess the way I would look at it is like if, if you were a food critic and you were just like, yup, I don't like Thai food. Thai food stinks. You're never going to find like someone with a really, like a food critic with a refined talent who's just like, yep, hate Thai food. Um, Cause as a, as somebody in that position, like you have to be better than that. You have to be able to evaluate all f different kinds of flavors and cuisines uh, with kind of uh, an open mind and, and an appreciation, right? That That's what it's about, an appreciation. Or if it's not executed in, in a, in a way that should be appreciated, then you don't have to appreciate much. I think the same can be said for music critics. Uh, yeah, uh, some music critics might have slants uh, towards different genres uh, or genres that they tend to uh, enjoy more than others. But in general, they should have a a vast, vast array of musics that uh, musical styles that they can appreciate 
much beyond the typical consumer who's going to choose like one or two musical genres that they like. Um, I expect a music critic to, to like a lot more different kinds of music than, than I like. Um, so in some respect, bringing this back to tennis, um, I, I definitely have an ability to appreciate tennis played in a lot of different ways. But I think, uh, generally speaking, do I like tennis that brings me more surprises? I think especially on TV, the answer to that question is yes. So when every point isn't played uh, very, very much the same, I like that. Um, I like to be surprised. I like to see things go a little bit differently, point in and point out. So, I mean, in general, I appreciate that. But I think it, it has a lot to do with matchups. Because there are a lot of players who maybe aren't so unpredictable, but when they match up against certain players, it can be really fun to watch uh, that kind of contrast play out. Um, I, I don't want to get too in the weeds on this question, uh, but I, I also want to point out that when you watch certain things live, like let's take a player who maybe isn't so unpredictable, Andre Rublev. I think Rublev is so terrific to watch live because it never gets old watching him strike the ball. It's breathtaking each and every time. And the power and the sound of the ball and the speed of the ball that comes through so so vividly when you're, you're close to the court, uh, that kind of thing, in my opinion, is a really fun watch. Uh, I also like players who just compete really hard. So like, let me make a uh, a WTA example of this, like one of my favorite players to watch continues to be Layla Fernandez. And uh, I just like how she competes, right? So that's outside of style, outside of play style. If somebody is is kind of going to wear their heart on their sleeve and compete really, really hard, it is something that I do appreciate as a viewer, that they care and they're not afraid to show you how much they care. All right, number two, uh, what top matchups do you enjoy the least? One that has gotten on my nerves as they've played so frequently is Medvedev versus Zverev. Zverev has the ability to make matches against top players end up being very low quality, and I have no clue how he does it. In fact, I don't really enjoy his matches against Tsitsipas or Rublev at all either. I, yeah, I mean, I kind of relate to not loving when Medvedev and Zverev play each other. I mean, they're kind of stylistic mirrors of each other. They don't really like to force the issue from the baseline. And they're both big servers. So they struggle to break each other. Uh, most of their baseline rallies end in errors. I mean, there have been moments in the head-to-head -head where Medvedev has tried to up the aggression with his forehand. There have also been moments in the head-to-head -head where Zverev has tried to come forward more often. But at the end of the day, I don't think they enjoy playing each other and as a neutral viewer, I don't think it really brings the, I don't think they bring the best out of each other at all. Uh, Eurosport named them rivalry of the year. Strange choice. I mean, which one match of theirs this year, like which one was extremely memorable or like very, very gripping? I know that they played a lot of matches and some close matches, but come on, like which one do you really remember as awesome theater? I don't know that there was one. They did have the beef, and, and that was fun. Uh, but I think the reason why Zverev kind of gets tagged with the, I don't know, boring to watch quality maybe more often than Medvedev is because, you know, yes, they play the same style. Zverev just has less personality than Medvedev, uh, who brings like a quirkiness to the court uh, and a quirkiness also to just the, the technique and the way he kind of implements the big serving counterpuncher with the strange technique, with the octopus-like court coverage, you know, Zverev covers the court great too. It just looks a little bit more conventional. It's not as visually striking. And those are probably the two reasons. That like Medvedev and Zverev, they kind of play the same style, but most people don't call Medvedev boring. Uh, certainly not as much as they call Zverev boring. I would say that's probably the reason. All right, third one here. Would Hercotch be better off abandoning his baseline game and committing to more serve and volley? Even some chip and charge? His forehand is too erratic to be relied on consistently, in my opinion, and it makes his baseline game break down easily in big points uh, when players fire cross-court forehands at him. Why not just go to the net at the first available opportunity? He has decent hands. 
Thanks. Enjoy the content as always. Thank you. Yeah, it's been something that I've been calling for for a while with Hercotch. Uh, he has never wanted to do it. But to me, it's elite serve, great volleys, kind of rough around the edges from the baseline. So, like, why are we not serve and volleying Hubert Hercotch? I don't know. I've never known the answer to that. I've never understood it. But, I mean, the hope is that he hits his forehand with the same quality that he did in the second half of this year. And if he does that, I think he's got a great chance to, at the very least, uh, make a run at, at the top eight next year. I think he's got a great chance to do that. Just, just because the forehand started to come off a lot better second half of this year. Next one from John Palmer, who is a member. Uh, remember, you can be a member by hitting the join button, support the channel for $2 a month. It is appreciated immensely. Hi, Gil. Can you just talk about what's going on with Nick Kyrgios right now? He basically missed the entire 2023 season. I know it's out of his control, but he also doesn't seem that motivated to get back into gear. Uh, the tennis commentary is cool, but I worry it's premature and he's going to let himself off the hook without ever pushing himself hard in tennis. Hypothetically, what do you think it would take for Nick to get back in the game and approach it with true effort? Thanks for all the amazing coverage. I, well, he did it in 2022. Like that That's where I would take issue with, that's where I would disagree with the comment. Uh, 2022, he gave it 100%. And I'm so glad that Nick Kyrgios... Nick Kyrgios will not retire and and us say we never really saw the answer to what would have happened if Nick Kyrgios tried hard. Because we did. We saw it. We can always now say we saw it. And by the way, it was just as good as we thought, many of us thought it would be. He won 70% of his matches. He made a major final. So he was really, really good. Here's what I'll say outside of, of those things about Nick Kyrgios' season this year, where he tried to come back, and it was like, it was strange, you know? He, I, I don't know medically what exactly happened here, because he tried to come back, and then he, uh, you know, that was grass court season. He played one match. It wasn't good, and then he didn't come back to play again. I don't, I don't have the details of what happened physically, um, but... Nick has said in the past, and I think we should take these things seriously, that his body is a lot older than what his actual age is because he treated his body poorly for years and years and years. Uh, going out, drinking, not eating a good diet, not getting enough sleep, not doing enough recovery. And those things just, it doesn't matter how disciplined he is now. It doesn't matter what he tries to do now at 28 years old. That will, years and years and years of that on the professional tour, that will come back to hurt Nick at some point. He is not going, he's unlikely to have a long career. And I think Nick even said it himself. Um, at, at one point, he said like, in reality, I'm, I'm more like 33, 34 years old. And he said that maybe last year. Uh, take him by his word. Like that is that is definitely true. So, unfortunately for Nick, I I do think he's actually pretty hungry and motivated at this point. the The hope is that he hasn't done so much irreparable damage early in his career that even a hungry and motivated Nick can't stay healthy. Fingers crossed that that's not the case, but it is a possibility. Next one is from Racket Talk, 6643. Hey, Gil, I have a couple of questions. Oh, by the way, also a member, thank you. Uh, one, we often talk about how Novak and Rafa, to some extent, had the baseline grinding game nailed back in like 2011, 2012, and that for Novak to be still so great in recent years, he has had to develop and fine-tune skills like his serve, volley, slice, and overall aggression. Do you think it's easier to develop attacking skills if your base is consistency rather than the other way around? All right, let me tackle this. This is a great question. It's just a really hard question. Really tough, but, but very good. I tend to think yes. I tend to think yes. 
with the caveat that we we've seen it both ways. We've seen players with weapons develop better consistency in time, and we've seen players who are more defensively inclined develop uh, attacking skills over time. So we've seen it both ways. Do I think uh, it's a little bit easier to go from consistent, solid, develop the weapons? As long as the physical tools are there, as long as you're strong enough to do it and you don't have a lot of like really big like technical issues standing in your way, uh, like like maybe Demon Ore, right? Then I think that's easier because I think it says something about your makeup and your personality. To have success as a grinder... I think you have to be a player who has mastered the art of hard work. You have to be gritty. Uh, you have to be tough physically and mentally. You have to be willing to suffer. I just think you must have that makeup. I know that you know how to work hard on the court. And I think from there, that's a good starting point to work on these other things. I think it's a lot harder to change a player who has always had a ton of talent and can finish points easily. And now you have to try to instill in them uh, a level of discipline that, that may not come natural to them. A level of, of physical and mental uh, wear and tear, you know, that you need to get them comfortable feeling that kind of uh, discomfort. And that could be very hard for a player, I think, to learn later on. If that's not their nature, if that's not their, their character and their personality, it's hard to change, in my opinion. That's all. Number two here, kind of going off the theme in the above question, uh, you had also mentioned in a mailbag that Federer didn't improve in as many areas as Nadal or Djokovic did in the 2010s, which led to his rate of winning going down. Do you think there is room for Federer to improve technically, aside from taking the backhand earlier, uh, bigger racket head, serve and volley more? Would you have liked to see those adjustments sooner in his career, or do you think he could only have improved in the clutchness category? Could any improvements have potentially given him more than four Grand Slam titles between 2011 and 2020? Look, yeah, in general, I just think all of the things he did in 2017, it would have been, would have been great for him to do those a little bit earlier. At the same time, you know, it's not it's not easy, right? Uh, especially when you are still in the mix. Uh, Roger was still having a lot of success, just losing to his rivals a bit more often. Um, yeah, it, it's not... I don't want to... Yeah, but, but in general, I think everything he did in 2017 would have helped if he did it a bit earlier. At least he got there eventually, right? Next one is from Vison. I hope I'm not too late with my question, but just curious. Sinner and Tsitsipas have been meeting at AO for two years straight now. Tsitsipas had won both, but since Sinner's impressive improvement recently, do you think that if they meet again in the Australian Open, Sinner would have the upper hand? The two times Sinner beat Tsitsipas this year was when he was injured at Rotterdam shoulder injury that happened during Davis Cup days before, and ATP Finals, back injury. If both of them are healthy, do you think it would be very close, or would it be a sinner match to lose? Well, it could be very close, but I do think that the things that were troubling sinner in that head-to-head -head have since been corrected. And just like we came into the year-end championships this year, looking at a lot of sinners head-to-heads and thinking, eh, probably misleading, probably doesn't mean much, I would say the same for this Sinner versus Tsitsipas scenario. Uh, Steph, like, I guess the big problem with Sinner in, in these previous two matchups at the Australian Open is uh, he was just getting dominated in the zero through four rally length. Uh, part of that was just because Tsitsipas, at his best in Australia, just had the serve and the forehand firing uh, to, to such an extent that he was having a lot of success on the serve. But the, one of the big things that stood out to me uh, was, you know, Sinner... Sinner just didn't serve big enough to actually take advantage of, of Tsitsipas' weakness. He just didn't serve well enough to bother Tsitsipas' return of serve. And, you know, 
obviously part of that is just bringing enough pace to that backhand return uh, to rush it and to get more misses. But it's also hitting effective changeups to his forehand uh, that are well placed enough where you're going to get good purchase out of that uh, those you know variety kind of changeups. As I said, so I would expect Sinner to just you know being a bigger server now doing a lot better against CT Pass in this head to head plain and simple uh this one is from Siriam given that Alcaraz is one of the shorter top players on tour already i believe he's closer to 5'10 or 5'11 notwithstanding his listed height listed height is 6 feet by the way and with the trend towards bigger players such that this delta is only going to increase Coupled with his playing style and likelihood that his height may limit his ability to improve his serve beyond this, is it possible that he peaks sooner and has a shorter peak than the big three, a.k.a. a career trajectory more like the pre-big three greats? Hmm. I don't think so. Are you saying like that you're basically saying uh, because of Alcaraz's height, is he almost going to be an, an antiquated player? moving forward um, because the the future is tall is kind of the question, which is a very interesting question. It's just that I don't see Alcaraz as somebody who um, who doesn't advance the game further. Um, I do think he advances the game further because there is as much power um, and as much firepower, as much offense in in Alcaraz as you could possibly want, um, even in his smaller, you know, his, his shorter height. I, I also think that the serve will improve a lot because the speed is not the problem. He he has the ability to serve pretty darn big, and that's even with some technical deficiencies that he can probably clean up further. So I do think the serve will get better, but also. Like, what is this tall trend, right? Here's what I will concede. If you look at, like, a Medvedev or a Zverev, the tall guys who move really well and serve really big, the one thing that they don't have is a great forehand. It, it does remain to be something that I have in the back of my mind moving forward is, are we going to see someone come up six foot six, six foot seven ish they move like a Medvedev or a Zverev, and they actually they bring a great forehand to the table. Because that player would be a really, really, really big problem. No doubt about it. So I see what you're saying in that respect, but as far as like Alcaraz being somebody who, I don't know, is not fitting in with the modern game. I, I don't agree with that. I think there is so much racket speed, so much all-court prowess, uh, so much offense and defense, so much athleticism that uh, none of these things really worry me all that much. Next one is from Gibon the Great. Hey, Gil, how much can we learn from Sinner's win over Djokovic at Davis Cup? Do you think Yannick is currently Novak's biggest threat in Australia? All right, what did we learn? It's a match that I watched uh, quite casually. I was on vacation. Uh, I watched the uh, end of the second set through to the th and, and the entirety of the third. It was so enjoyable. Uh, it was such a great match. Uh, clutchness came into play, obviously, just a couple of points here and there. Novak had more break points in the third set, and he had triple match point. And then he didn't convert. And then Sinner broke in the very next game. Tale as old as time. I mean, how often has, have we seen it in the sport of tennis? It's amazing that even the greats, even, even Novak Djokovic, is not immune to having something like that happen to him. But again, Sinner, and I think we've seen it almost every time they've played, like, I guess, what did we learn? It's... Djokovic had to really leave his comfort zone in that year-end championship final. He had to hit bigger. He had to change direction more. He's, he just had to be more offensive. He had to beat center to the punch. And I guess what we learned is that, like the same thing, I guess, that maybe we learned in the round robin stage when center beat Djokovic. It's uh, one that Yannick's nerve management has gotten really, really good. From, from all the confidence that 
he has, uh, I guess, built up. And two is that when when Djokovic doesn't take Sinner's time away, Sinner has the consistency and the point construction and the variety and the power, like the offensive package, to hit through Novak. So a passive Novak Djokovic, a Djokovic that isn't taking it to Sinner with high-end ball speeds, with tons of change of direction, with great court positioning, all of those things. A Djokovic that isn't doing that is very vulnerable against Sinner in the form that we saw him in the last month um, or so. So I guess that's what we learned. But did we learn it? Because we had already seen it twice. Um, what a way for, for Sinner to finish this year. Uh, what a surge it was. The second part of this question is, do you think Yannick is currently Novak's biggest threat in Australia? I imagine most of the people watching, listening to this podcast are thinking the answer to that question is yes. You know me. You know me. Um, I'm I'm not there because I have a thing where I don't... I, I, I just, time and time again, I try to understand that when the season ends, the players who were hot at the end of it are not necessarily going to kill it in January. And generally speaking, that momentum, it does not continue. It just doesn't happen uh, because it's harder. Um, so all the confidence, all the, the, the form and the good feelings that Sinner, uh, built up, it starts from scratch next year. It starts from scratch. And I think a bigger threat to Novak is a player who's already beaten him in a major final in Carlos Alcaraz and potentially probably tied. I think Medvedev and Sinner are just about tied, but yes, Daniil Medvedev who gives Djokovic uh, has played Djokovic tough on hard courts time and time again. Um, and, and even... Honestly, I think Sinner's a bigger threat than Medvedev, okay? Right now, I do. So, I'll, I'll amend that. Just thinking about it, you know, Djokovic just knows exactly what to expect out of Medvedev, knows exactly what he's getting. Uh, the, the weapons aren't as scary for Novak. You know, like Medvedev, especially in rally, just doesn't take the, the racket out of Djokovic's hands in a way that Sinner does, to the likes of which I think only Vavrinka and team have ever really previously been able to do. Maybe Federer as well. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't think that Sinner is a bigger threat to Novak in Australia than Alcaraz. I think to, to get there would be to react too strongly to post-US Open play, which I don't do. I just don't do it. And it's served me really, really well in the past. Really well. It's had me kind of on the right side of these things coming into next year more often than not. Um, and like when we revisit top 10 predictions, uh, did I give Felix a super optimistic prediction? No. Did I give Runa as optimistic a prediction as most people? No. Uh, that was last year. And I was right in, in both cases. So for Sinner... It's the same thing. I'm not going to be like, yep, he's the second best in the world. It's him and Djokovic. No, I don't feel that way. I don't. There's nothing he could do post-US Open to get me to that place. And that'll do it for the final mailbag of the year. Stay tuned uh, for Monday Match Analysis this week, final MMA, before the MMA Awards. Um, it will be some next-gen final stuff, and we're going to bring on Alex Gruskin to go through each and every one of the ATP Top 20, uh, just so that we make sure that we've touched on everyone and covered everyone uh, ahead of the 2024 season. Hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to subscribe. I'll see you next time.